Alex has graciously agreed to uh, talk to us about data quality. Um, and uh, I think Alex is, is pretty uniquely qualified to talk about this topic. Um, you, you were an AIM crew member, what, five years ago in NorCal? Yeah. So Northern California BLM AIM crew um, in 2013. Four, yeah, that was 14. 2014. Yeah. Um, and from there went to Taos uh -huh. as a crew lead mm -hmm. and then stayed on with Taos as kind of their kind of aim kind of coordinator guy at the uh, at the Taos field office BLM and then eventually with the state office right uh, yeah. working with Zoe Davidson there so so Alex has had a lot of experience in one collecting monitoring data but but two also doing trainings uh, and calibrations and doing this sort of quality, you know, assurance, quality control stuff that he's going to talk about. And, and, and really sort of one, why it's important for just any, you know, monitoring or data collection effort, but why it becomes super important once you start having a whole bunch of people collecting data and contributing it to a, to a larger effort. So Alex, go right ahead. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. So, I mean, that was a great introduction, Jason. So, yeah, I was basically um, towards the end of that, I was uh, a monitoring coordinator for the state of New Mexico, which means I was basically in charge of a lot of data. So a lot of different crews and kind of a lot of different projects, mostly vegetation monitoring, but also some uh, rare plant monitoring as well. And um, so through that, I got a lot of experience um, with and correcting data. So I'll try and give some of those examples from from that experience in this. Um, yeah, and also part of my work with the BLM as an instructor for these AIM trainings. So does everyone know what AIM stands for? Hand up if you don't know what it means. Okay, so that stands for Assessment, Inventory, and Monitoring. So it's the BLM's kind of BLM-wide vegetation monitoring program. So we kind of went around um, BLM states in the West and trained crews to go out and collect data. And this is actually one of the presentations like from that training. So I apologize if, if, if it seems kind of too generic or stock, I kind of just stole it from that, um, those instructors. So. And feel free to ask any questions as we go. Um, makes it a lot more fun for me instead of just standing here talking. Uh, so yeah. So, Obviously, when we're monitoring we're, and when we're making decisions, um, we're using data from all over the place. So, in this example, we, you know, we could be using um, GIS or remote sensing data in comparison with all of these dots here of vegetation plots. So they have tons of data associated with them, and often we're we're using lots of different data inputs to make a decision and. It's really important to keep track of um, like where that data comes from and the amount of error that's in that data um, to be able to make good decisions. So it's, it's really, really important to, to understand like where the error comes from and how it's made and how to manage that data with different data sets. Yeah, this is just an example really of how um, lots of different data sets across the whole nation can be put together to make decisions. And the reason we want to be concerned about data quality is that data right here is like it's a right at the bottom of this like flow chart, right? So if we have bad data, we're gonna we're gonna make bad interpretations and we're gonna have bad analysis and in the end we're gonna probably make poor decisions, right, in terms of land management. So it's really important to get good data and then when you can't actually when you can't get, you know, no one's perfect, we can't get perfect data, but it's really important to understand the limitations of that data when making decisions. Yeah. Um, so I put, this is my like one addition to this presentation. I put this cactus here because I think it's really cute. Um, but also it's it was, it's a endangered cactus that I worked on in New Mexico. And I put that there basically because um, good data about that cactus basically Kind of led to its protection in terms of um, how that land was managed. So it's 
it grows pretty much exclusively in areas where there's tons of oil and gas development. So good quality data is able to inform like land management to actually protect that species. So that's just one example of how good data can be used to actually make really good decisions. Make sense? Any questions so far? Okay, yeah. So going on from that, um, there's a couple ways where we can basically um, make sure that we, we have good quality data. Um, so one way is actually defining our data flow. So actually before you even start thinking about going out to the field and monitoring, is actually having a, a schedule for where the data goes, who's handling it, um, like time frames of who has it and, and where it is, and being able to keep track of all that. Um, that's really important. And going through all of this is um, continuous quality assurance and quality control. So data quality control should definitely be continuous. It's not just like a process that we do, you know, in the winter time when we're stuck in an office and we have a bunch of data, we do some quality control. It's, it's actually something we do before we go out to the field, during field data collection, and then after again as well. So it's, it's like a constant process. And um, it's kind of split up into these two, two areas, quality assurance and quality control. So I think um, a lot of module four talked a lot about data quality. So this kind of feeds on from that. Um, but quality assurance is that process that we do, um, for example, all the steps that we lead, that we do leading up to actually um, leaving our like monitoring plot. Um, so it's basically catching errors and preventing them from happening in the first place. But once we've actually left our monitoring location, we're back in the office, we've left our plot or whatever, um, that kind of assurance process has stopped. We can't really prevent the errors, like they've happened or they haven't. And then we kind of move into quality control. So it's um, that's basically just checking that checking that we have complete data, and if we can, like trying to fix those um, data missing data errors and all that. Um, often it's just kind of actually describing um, what data is missing, etc. So it's a, a lot more like limited process. So you want to do more quality assurance to prevent those errors before they ever happen in terms of, instead of actually correcting them afterwards or just describing them. Yeah, so active data management again, just like continuously um, thinking about quality. Okay, so this is like an example of the defined data flow. So this is straight from the kind of aim data flow, the assessment imagery monitoring um, data flow from the BLM. So it all starts, well, it all starts with sample design selection. So good sample design is actually, it's a really good example of quality assurance. You can make sure your quality is, is good and prevent errors by actually creating really good sampling design. Uh, and then super important I found is training. So training and Calibration. Uh, I'll talk about calibration a little bit later, but they're super important for quality control. So if we have really, really good uh, field technicians and field crews um, that know exactly what they're doing and they're all recording the same things, we get really good data. And if we we don't train or we train poorly, um, then you know that's reflected in the data and then reflected in management decisions. So training is super important. Um, yeah, and on through data collection and then quality control after the field season is finished. So yeah, it's just a really nice example of how each of these like quality control steps have been described and broken out. So really good example for a monitoring program. Okay. Um, so y'all probably know this from the the module four that we just went over, but um, you get two types of sampling errors, right? You can, well, two types of errors, sorry. Um, sampling errors, um, so this is um, sampling errors are something that for the most part 
people in the field, like field <laughs> technicians collecting data, um, aren't going to be too worried about. It's sampling error is, is kind of a, like a statistical error that we can't really control. And we, we try and minimize that as much as possible by having really good, you know, random or stratified sample <laughs> designs. So we get a really nice, like, representative sample of the population. But there's some variance or variability um, that we call sampling error. So it's kind of, for the most part, like out of our hands. And then, so non-sampling error, um, these are things that we can actually, like, really prevent with quality assurance and quality control. Um, so these can be things like just straight up missing data, like I forgot to take a photo. That's you know a non-sampling error that um, yeah, that's a, an example of a non-sampling error of omission or commission is where um, we've just kind of recorded something incorrectly basically um, in the field. So if I I wasn't trained very well and I I put my like pin flag down on a line point and I look at I hit a rock but I forgot what a rock is and because I had these terrible instructors at the training. And I put a soil instead. That would be an example of. So we can reduce the non-sampling errors with QA and QC. So yeah, again, QA or quality assurance is preventing errors from really ever happening. It's like a it says anticipatory process. So you're doing it for the most part before you're even collecting the data and during data collection. Um, and then once you've left your monitoring location, um, that basically is, is stopped quality assurance. You can't do any more quality assurance um, unless you, know, you spot that error in the field and go back and correct it immediately. So yeah, preventing errors and then quality control. Um, so it's mostly just identifying errors, uh, seeing where there's missing data, um, and then describing them. And some part of quality control, you might be able to um, fix some errors, but for the most part, like I said, it's just it's just describing them. Okay. So quality assurance. So um, like I said, from that timeline, a big part of that is training. So making sure that everyone is calling a rock a rock, etc. And um, following that and doing that is calibration. So this is like a, something that we do to make sure that everyone is um, recording the same things and so that they know um, um, we can see where people are making errors. So basically what calibration um, involves is, um, for example, for line point intercepts, everyone in the crew or everyone in the training would read the exact same line of line point. And then we'd look at where the difference is. So, for example, you can look at specific indicators like um, percent of bare ground on that line, and see how close each of those um, each of those people or each of those observers were on that line. Um, and that's a really good way to actually, you know, talk about um, the monitoring methods. So, you know, if, if you find a spot on the transect that you disagreed about, you can go back and look at that and figure out why you disagreed um, and kind of hash out those details. So it's really good um, for training. Um, and then that should be kind of a continuous process, right? So calibrating as often as possible for the, for the AIM crews, for the BLM. Uh, we do uh, training every, every month or every time that you move to like a different um, kind of ecosystem. So working in uh, shrubland can be very different from working in like a grassland or a forested system. So it can, um, it's really good to calibrate when you move between those different systems. Um, yeah, data management. So keeping track of data. I've had issues, um, you know, somewhat out of my control, but um, had one, one week's of data was lost when, um, lightning hit the Taos field office building and it like zapped my computer. It wiped the hard drive and it wiped the USB drive that I had backed it up on, which was done. Um, and I lost like a week's worth of data. Um, 
So that kind of that was a poor data management decision for me. So after that, I backed everything up three times and put it like once on paper, once on data, once on USB, and then you know occasionally in the cloud. So little like data management like that, keeping track of where your data is, backing it up. Um, that's really helpful for um, quality assurance. Um, <coughs> electronics data capture. So um, I know for like NRI crews, you guys use like a tablet, right, to collect data. Um, similarly for the BLM, um, data collection is um, preferred on a, like a yeah, electronic tablet um, using a access database. And they're really good for like catching errors like while you're recording because um, uh, a lot of these programs will, and you could do this in Excel, right, as well with just like data validation rules. Um, if you put in something that is impossible, you know, you can yell at you or tell you that's wrong or you won't be able to record it. So that's actually really helpful, you know, after a long day in the field and you're, you write something down accidentally in the tablet and it can catch those checks, uh, you can catch those mistakes. So electronic data capture is really useful for that. Um, and then, yeah, just a continual data check. So, um, yeah, I'm talking about quality assurance. So this is like data checks while you're still in the field. So, for example, if you do like a line of trans a, a, a transect line um, of line point intercept, um, go back and like look at your data, and you know you can have a look to see roughly what the background is, what the folio cover percentage is from your data, and then just make a kind of like red face test. Does that make sense from what I'm seeing on this plot? So for example, if I've just done a line of LPI and sagebrush shrubland and I go back and look at my data sheet and then realize that there's no sagebrush recorded, I can be like, okay, wait, something's going on here. Let's redo that line and catch that error. So yeah, data checks continuously, super helpful. Um, I feel like I've talked about training tons, but um, yeah. Should be everyone should be trained frequently with um, uh, frequent calibration as well. Um, yeah, so I think I mentioned this already. Calibration monthly or every time you move to a different ecosystem, um, and during the training as well. So it's, it's just a really good training exercise to, to go through that. So. These are some real life calibration results, um, I think from AIM data, right? Um, this is AIM and the uh, wind erosion network. Oh yeah, cruise. Okay. Yeah. Cool, so these are each dot here is an observer. So each dot is a, is a person and um, zero is like the crew mean basically for that vegetation crew. So the further away from zero, the more you're deviating from your crew mean. And this, like, does this data look good to you guys? Yeah, so you're nodding your head. Yeah, it's pretty good. Like, it's pretty tight. There's, for the most part, you know, majority of people are within plus or minus 5% of their crew mean. So that's like a pretty, pretty good uh, amount of error that we can deal with. Um, so this is for folio cover. And uh, there's a couple of people in the kind of four category, but for the most part, uh, people can tell the difference between plants and bare ground, which is excellent for vegetation monitoring. Um, and, you know, bare ground, like I said, it's kind of the opposite, it's the inverse of photo cover. People are generally pretty good, and there's maybe a little bit more. This, I don't know who this is. <coughs> they probably didn't last too long. Um, you know, that could be from. Um, not being able to tell the difference between a rock and bare ground, or maybe someone dropped a pin and they they moved the one single piece of gravel away and it was bare ground instead of gravel, etc. But um, so for whatever reason, bare ground is slightly harder to calibrate on. And then this is litter. So people are terrible at recording or figuring out what litter is, right? And you know there are many reasons for this, but it's just good. It's a good example to realize that some indicators, they may have like a lot more variability than other indicators. So 
it's really good to keep that in mind when making decisions. Um, if you know if your decisions are based on um, like a threshold of litter cover, I can't imagine why that. Maybe for fire, fine fuels, that might be really important. You, it's really good to realize that there might be a higher uh, amount of variability in that data. And looking at this, it's also really helpful for quality assurance because you you can then you know next year or later on in the season actually focus more on like in the training or the calibration on like deciphering the difference between litter and not litter. So um, so litter basically for those of you um, who are not familiar is just um, a detached piece of plant material um, and you know I think a lot of the confusion comes from is is it attached or is it not attached? I think it's possibly where there's variability. But it's that's really important, you know, maybe improve next year, actually improve the training on litter or spend a bit more time on that or discuss it a bit more in coverage. Cool. Okay, so um, yeah, having established data standards are really important. Um, so one thing that I really love is like file naming conventions. Um, so I, I came across this. Um, this was yeah particularly useful. I was doing some um, some again like rare cactus monitoring. I did a lot of that for some reason. Um, we had a big crew of about twenty people over about a month collecting uh, uh, data, GPS locations, and photos of cactus. And at the end of the month, I had about 400 photos to go through to try and figure out who they belong to and where they came from, you know, which point in time they were, uh, they were from. And having like a systematic naming convention for those, like save my bacon basically, because it meant, you know, having uh, the data collector, the date, the name, and the location in each photo name was super helpful for me. So naming conventions can be really helpful for that. Uh, and it, it's really easy to, um, because of that, you can really easily know when you're missing data. Um, so you can much more easily, you know, you know we're missing a photo from this area. Let's go back and fix that error somehow. Um, yeah, so keeping that standardized and consistent is, again, really important. Um, and yeah, and the other thing I have on here is keeping track of metadata as well. So again, just like recorders, um, naming, recording people's names who are recording and observing um, the dates and times, like those little bits of metadata are super important for um, data quality. So, um, so I get a break from talking. We're going to go through this data sheet. Do you like images? Um, so this is an example of a really bad data sheet, um, and we use this in the AIM trainings. Um, oh yeah, you can. Don't give away all the answers. I mean, you can. So yeah, just um, based on your knowledge and common sense, um, just spend like a couple minutes looking through the data sheet and try and spot as many errors as you can. Uh, and then we can go through them. So I'll just give you a couple minutes.
is there anyone that's not familiar with like USDA plant codes? Like that could be important. Yeah. Okay, so basically, it's a uh, um, each plant is given like a four letter code, right? Um, so, for example, uh, it's just the first two letters of the genus, first two letters of the species. So, for example, Brody here is uh, Brownstone Bottom Tea Grass. So, that's like a standardized name. So, each, every single species can have a Okay, does anyone see any errors? Anyone like to provide one? Yeah. Does it tell you which trans are on? Yeah, exactly, right? This it's come it's blank up here. Like they're in Red Lake, wherever that is, and we have no idea. No. Red Lake four. Yeah, okay, great. Excellent. Um, but they could be on then maybe they're not on the line at all. They they could just be wandering through the lake. We have no idea. We don't know what line. Yeah, excellent. Really what they're doing is the metric system with the US system. True. Yep. These measurements could all be in inches or centimeters. Okay. Yeah. 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 Any more? The names or submissions. Yeah. So that's actually a really big one that I like nitpick about. Like um, JK could be, you know, I don't know. Generic one, right? Or it could be Jason Carl, it could be John King, it could be like a lot of people. And when you're in big groups, or you know, for example, when I when you're managing data from a whole state, there's well, there's gonna be someone that has like the same initials. So yeah, writing up on names super helpful. Yep, page number. Yeah, so a lot of this metadata up here is just completely missing, right? They page one of you know, that's just annoying. We don't know how many pages there are. Um, we don't have the asthma, the date, um, or the spacing interval. So that's really important. You know, spacing interval, that could be a really important monitoring, you know, bit of metadata. We need to know, like, how often they're actually measuring. So that stuff's really important. What about, like, with um, any of this stuff? Which should be easier. Boxes oh, would. Right. It makes it look like you need to pull it. Totally. Like nothing. Yeah, so I think they um, this was went through in the module four, right? Um, you know the difference between a bank and a zero, um, and bank is just you know it's missing data, right? It's we don't know what it is. So they could mean maybe they forgot to record a top capacity here, or it could be a non. It could be they just yeah, it could, it could be they just forgot. So yeah, bank cells. Okay. Not consistent for litter either because it's in like your canopy cover and in your soil surface. Yeah, totally. That's awesome. So um, for a lot of monitoring programs, um, for example, like AIM, um, litter is not considered a surface code. And you can tell from the rest of this data sheet that um, litter is up here in the canopy um, and it shouldn't be down here. Soil as well. So yeah, consistency in your actual like um, monitoring the protocols. Yeah, maybe they maybe there was soil underneath, or maybe they just forgot the method in that sample as well. Yeah. Anything else? If you have cheap grass in your species type. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, that's awesome. So this is one of those things that. Um, you know, Excel or Access can stop pretty quickly from happening. Um, um, so, for example, the database that AIM uses is called DEMA, the database for inventory monitoring and assessment. And if you try to put Birdie in that box, it would just it would yell at you. It would be real unhappy and give you a warning and tell you to do it again. Um, so, yeah, that's yeah, great. It's fault. Well, um, sagebrush that doesn't have a height and there's a height for a bush. Yep, exactly. So at the end of the day, we, we kind of have to like throw that data out, right? We can't we can't make it up. Once we've left the field, we can't pretend that we remember what that was or fill in the blanks. Um, we effectively just have to kind of throw out that data and 
describe that it's missing. But yeah, it's a good spot. Yeah, and there's, um, for those of you who are not as familiar as well with USDA farm codes, um, something I already hate here is SAGE. So SAGE is a four letter code for like, I don't know what it is, it's like probably a moss from Alaska or something. Um, but it's ambiguous to know whether that's the USDA code or like a common name. So being really consistent in how you're recording data is super important. Cool. Any other errors you guys can see? Okay, one other thing I'll mention. Something like 36 errors on yeah. this form, so there yeah. are a lot. Right. Yeah, there are a lot. So some of them you, you probably wouldn't realize because um, some of them are, are protocol dependent, right? Mm -hmm. um, like uh, on line two, the soil surface code of RF, that like that code doesn't exist. They just made that up. So there's like, yeah, there's no there's no way you would know that, right? But but yeah, there are a couple of other ones that are pretty clear that I don't think we've seen yet. And there's so. another one with the like herb height having a 21 meter inch or centimeter tall cheat grass. <laughs> and the other one's only five or whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, if that was inches, I would definitely be skeptical. You know, that's. But if you don't know, they don't tell you. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Like checking um, those heights, like that's like that red face test. Like, does this make sense? Like, did I actually record like a three meter stage brush or something? You know? But yeah, it's really important to go through that. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So, right. Yeah, exactly. And it's simple. So, I actually mentioned in that module um, that it was okay to do lines. But I, I would disagree um, with that. Like, um, the lines here, they're still like, they're ambiguous in terms of um, do they mean, you know, do they mean birdie all the way down through here or there, or is it actually nothing? Do they not, did they record that or not? So um, yeah, I would always advocate for filling out every single box, um, no kind of like shortcuts, like these marks, because um, it, it just makes your life a lot easier when you're entering that data, especially like a lot of this data gets entered um, by someone else, you know, that wasn't actually in the field um, back in the office. So just understanding someone's handwriting is hard enough, let alone like their symbols or abbreviations. So, yeah, good one. Um, anything else? Anything? Exposing their soil surface, that's not going to work out. So that is actually, um, that's part of the AIM protocol. That's actually okay. So when it hits the base of the Right, yeah. So for fact, like bunch of grasses, if you hit that. The base, yeah, or just small bunch. But that just that does that depends on the protocol. But did you get that in your upper cover too? That has ten and has none. You're hitting the base of the plant. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's really good. So, yeah, so they've they've said that there's nothing in the canopy, but then they're hitting a grass. Like you have to have that grass somewhere up there in the canopy. So, yeah, that's great. So they should have recorded here. Posey, HL, Posey. Uh, and kind of the inverse here is they've recorded it three times. Um, and again, that's just kind of like a protocol thing, but there's no need for this kind of lower level Posey in there because we already know we can. Right. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, I think you guys you hit the major ones. Um, the other thing I would mention as well is um, going back to that like red face testing. Um, actually, using these boxes at the bottom. So if you are collecting on a tablet, um, you know, Access and Excel can do these calculations automatically, which is super helpful. Um, but on paper, it actually really helps to just to do those calculations manually as well, because um, that gives you that, that test. You know, if you end up finding that you have 10% foliar cover when you, you're in like a you know, really dense like forested system that clearly has a lot of canopy, you might go back to that data and think, okay, 
who maybe we forgot to like even tap at the trees or something, you know. And that's really important again to do on the plot so you can actually go back and correct it. Any other glaring errors, Jason, that you want to point out? I think that's most That's of most of them. Yeah. There's a lot of inconsistency in codes and things, but. Oh, the, are you going to talk about unknown plant codes? I can. Yeah, so so line 24, you know, it, it, it this, this is common, right? You, you, will, you will come across things that you don't know what they are out in the field, right? And, and it's super important whenever you or put a monitoring program together or if you're working on a monitoring program to, to define what you do in case that you run across a plant you don't know what it is right and and so aim has some very specific unknown plant protocols that allow us to track you know like what those things were and then go back and fix the data sheets once we figure them out okay and so and again there's no way you would know this but but on line 24 there they're not using the right unknown plant codes. They're using wrong codes. But I think it's just worth pointing out that, that you should have some sort of system in place for tracking your unknown plants and then fixing those uh, afterwards, right, after the fact. So. Yeah, I, I think my first, I remember my first field season in California, we had, it was, this was like the beginning of the infancy of that AIM protocol in the BLM, so there was a lot of a lot of like lack of guidance and like protocols for like how to describe these things but i remember looking at our like unknown species list and it had a lot of things like super fuzzy stick plant and that was like in the data sheet you know like crammed into one of these boxes or like there was an asterisk being like really fuzzy like super fuzzy seeds or something like that this was useless like it's not we're never gonna like know what that was again you know uh, once we've left that plot. So yeah, having a protocol for that is super helpful. All right, okay. Yeah, that's that. Thank you for your participation. Um, and there's just a few more slides. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. So a lot of that was like quality assurance, right? Because it's happening on the plot and we can prevent those errors, we can go back and, and figure out what went wrong and correct them. Um, but a lot of what we do is like quality control. So that's after we've left the field in the office a lot of the time. Um, just most of it is just like um, figuring out what data is missing. So um, I mean it happens like more often than not where you know, we've, we've got some plots that are missing entire like data collection methods. Like for example, we come back after a week of work and then we realize that we just forgot to measure anything on transect two of this like plot 24, you know? Um, and there's not much we can do about that other than um, know that it's missing and then maybe, maybe we could go back to that site if we kind of really want our technicians to go back in the field and do some extra work. Um, you could maybe correct that. Um, but for the most part, we're just describing that that data is missing. Uh, and for the most part, it's not like entirely missing things. It's just like little bits um, that are missing from certain protocols. So um, one thing we see a lot is um, missing photos. So maybe you know the photo was like in the full sun and it was just like completely white no contrast and you couldn't see anything. Um, really good idea to check your photos in the field before you leave. So if you do have that, you can just take another one. But um, once you've left, you, you, you're a lot more limited in terms of what to do with that. So a lot of missing photos. Um, I have an example of a kind of like missing data sheet from one of my crews in Taos. So and a nice an advantage of like going through this is that you can like figure out like first of all why that error happened, um, so you can maybe correct it, but also just like make sure it doesn't happen again in the future, right? So um, can't really do much about this. Like they just forgot to collect um, 
maybe, you know, again, that goes into training and quality assurance to make sure people know what they're meant to be collecting from our bank space. Um, here's an example of that data management or like um, naming convention. So this is labeled incorrectly. Um, uh, I think it was just some soil bit information that was labeled incorrectly and like because we we had that incorrect label, we don't know how to, where that data fits. So we effectively just can't use that data anymore because we don't know where it's from. So it's getting really important to keep track of um, those naming conventions. Um, some other things like some things are just you know not not even um, mistakes of technicians but for example here they were trying to collect soil samples and um, the plot was just basically a mountain like covered in rock so they just couldn't collect their samples so things like that it's really good to know when you're looking at that data um, and you can't really do much about it either yeah, it's really good to like look through these things to keep track of what's missing to try and figure out how you can improve, you know, next year's or next week's data collection. Um, some of this is just excuses. But yeah, a lot of it is to do with um, a mislabeling again pops up. Um, so keeping track of data, super important. Yeah. Um, but it's just, it's really nice to have that um, and to like go through, go through those things regularly. Um, so this, that's not something you do at like the end of the season, but maybe like at the end of a couple of weeks to go through that and like figure out like, okay, um, we're doing this wrong or if we keep forgetting this thing, maybe we should like make it more obvious. I put a lot of flagging, pink flagging tape on everything so I don't lose things and uh, that helps me remember them. But. Um, yeah, you can really like improve the quality of your monitoring if you're just like, constantly checking for data. Of course. Uh, yeah. Um, so one really nice way of quality control is lab testing. Um, I think there's an example later on in this that goes through that. Um, but calibration again can be another way of like measuring that the error between people. Um, to describe, you know, the, the variance between data collectors. Uh, that calibration of data is really important for that. Um, yeah, and a lot of quality <laughs> control just comes in, like, how you manage your data and archive it and analyze it, etc. Like, for example, I think um, that module for had the example of just, like, not deleting or not selecting, like, the whole data when you're, like, analyzing or making a graph or something in Excel. But little things like that. Uh, yeah, and so quality control is basically just these three things, right? Making sure it's complete, making sure it's correct, and making sure it's all consistent. So, um, yeah, this is a bit kind of some analysis you can do with data um, as part of your quality control checks. So you can check for things if to see if the correct plant protocols are following. So this is a check, like we saw on those data sheets, to see if those correct codes are actually being used. Um, all the green stuff is those good codes. They're like the generic USDA codes. Um, and these, these orange bits are codes that are just not in that USDA plant database. So really important to have that information to know, you know what's going on. Um, and to kind of you know measure that error in your data, um, and then you want to check to see that your data is complete. So just checking for missing protocols, missing photos, any sort of missing data. So for example, here they um, in this data set they forgot, or I think it says so there's an unknown or zero value in the ecological site there. So either they couldn't figure out the ecological site, they forgot to do that, or um, maybe it was just kind of didn't match any ecological site when they were on that smaller communication. Um, and that meant that they couldn't record data for the ecosystem number. Um, and you can also just check for consistency, so maybe move this box. So a lot of um, protocols you can kind of like check between 
um, or method purchasing. Um, you can compare methods between um, between each other to see how consistent they are between each other. So, for example, um, this plot up here is looking at uh, line point data on the bottom um, for basically no canopy cover, and uh, on the y-axis here we have the the same kind of indicator but measured with a canopy gap intercept method. So we can see how well those data correlate. You know, they should be related pretty closely. Um, and you know, just like maybe these plots up here, something something was going on with data collection um, that we should be aware about. Um, yes. I can't quite remember what this example is about. But it's looking at kind of the variability of different herbaceous and woody heights uh, on each plot. Cool. Do you have a question? No. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. So this is kind of another like QC check you can do um, after the season or after your data collection is finished. Just looking at like temporal variability. Um, as we know, like plants change through the season. So we might find that if we're collecting a certain area at a certain time that we're actually biasing our data because um, there might be less foliar cover at certain times or more based on you know, plant senescence and annuals popping up, et cetera. So um, this is a great you know, method for looking at when the plots were done to see if there's any kind of like clumping. If we'd be Concerned if there was, you know, areas where there were all dark blue and areas that were all kind of lighter, right? Because then there'd be maybe some like temporal, like spatial bias there. Um, and one way to actually prevent this from happening, a really good um, like quality assurance step, is just to have a really good sample design. So um, setting up your monitoring or sampling design so that you're collecting. Uh, at certain locations at certain times, you can spread out your um, your points in a manner that's consistent across um, you know your whole population area, and um, instead of maybe like collecting all the data that's really close to your office first, and then like moving further away or doing the opposite, because then you're kind of creating this gradient in time, right? You might have less cover for the stuff that you monitored later in the season, and it's all dead. So yeah, pretty really good to look at that. Um, and this is similar, you know, breaking it up by different indicator, um, looking at different variability across the year. Cool. And so calibration data is really useful for looking at um, uh, not just calibration data, but um, also just uh, in monitoring data. It can be really good for looking at the inter person variability. Um, so kind of as I mentioned before, like with litter, there's oh with, with litter there's like more variation. Everyone kind of has more variation with litter um, compared to a like, favorable cover or bare ground, uh, which we kind of expect because bare ground's really easy to figure out and litter is slightly ambiguous. So it's good to put a, like a value and a number on that um, those indicators. Um, and you can also compare people. Um, so um, this this is one really well calibrated group for the most part. So this is looking at bare ground um, on the y-axis here. And, um, we've got a group of seven people. And for the most part, all these guys on the left and on the right, they're like pretty tight, right? You know, those error bars aren't really overlapping, but they are overlapping. Yeah tied together, these guys are calibrated, right? Because they've been collecting data all year. And then there's this one kind of outlier um, that uh, is the expert, um, Jason Clark. Um, Jake is the expert that wasn't actually calibrated with these crews. So the expert came in and um, helped out with data collection uh, without calibrating with crews, and this is the kind of effect that um, the, he was seeing a lot more background than um, everyone else, right? Um, so 
yeah, um, so it's really good to look at that. And this is just really kind of a good example of why calibration is really helpful um, to get everyone on the same page. Yeah. Should we get the backstory with that? Yeah, you should get the backstory. Okay, so I'm the expert in this graph. Uh, these are real data. And um, this was, again, early days with the AIM program with BLM. Um, and this is a real kind of lessons learned thing for, for us, right? So, so the, these, it, there were two crews uh, that were working uh, in the Winnemucca District uh, BLM. And I came in and spent a week with them uh, collecting data, just kind of seeing how things were going, right? And, um, you know, it was, at this point in AIM, this was like 2011, 2012, we weren't really doing a lot with this kind of calibration idea yet, right? And and the the presumption was that you know yeah because I've collected hundreds of plots of LPI, right? That that you know I know what I'm doing, and and I can just swoop in and and you know help with this kind of system. Well, it turns out that you know I'd been collecting data that year in southern New Mexico where there's a whole lot of bare ground relative to northwest Nevada, right? And so I'm just, I was like keyed in on seeing the bare ground versus seeing other things, right? And so just in my, in my normal observations and, and data collection, I was recording more bare ground than other people were, right? Because I wasn't calibrated to that system and I wasn't calibrated to that other crew. And so, so you know, when we started looking at this, we we're like, oh, yeah, oops, you know? But it really sort of made us start thinking about this, these ideas of calibration. And so this is something that, you got to kind of watch out for, right? You'll have people that want to drop in and help collect data, and and but you have to stop and think about what are the influence that they might be having on the data that you're collecting, right? So so you know if your advisor wants to come and you know collect data on your project, maybe just you know give him the the you know pen and paper, and he can just write stuff down, right? You know, um, but so so yeah, this calibration issue is real, and it it's important and it can have influence on the results. Yeah. Always be wary of experts. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is like another quality control step. It's really nice when you can um, actually calibrate your what you're seeing in the field with like lab tests. So this is looking at soil clay percentage. Um, so in the field we have crews texture just with their hand texture soils and estimate clay percentage. Now we can sample that soil in the lab and get really precise measurements of clay um, percentage um, and textures. So it's that's one tool. Unfortunately, you can't really do that with like other indicators like only cover. You can't put that in a lab and get exact numbers. Unfortunately, uh, maybe with drones. Uh, we'll see. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, that's just like one nice. Um, uh, method for both like calibrating so if you if you are like looking at soils look at the lab data like the known soil samples that's a really good way to learn and it's also a good check to see okay like actually with these sandy soils um, people are pretty good at estimating um, the clay percentage right people can tell the difference between sand um, and clay, but then for these kind of clayier soils with more clay, there's a lot more variability. So it's actually harder to tell the clay percentage in this clay soil. So it's good to know that there's that difference in variance between those two different uh, indicators. Yeah. Um, yeah, data management. So this is just an example of that DEMA I was talking about, database for inventory monitoring assessment. Um, really helpful to quality assurance, um, as well as kind of storing the data and backing it up and all that. So um, yeah, I'm a big advocate of collecting things electronically, electronically and then storing them electronically. It's a really good um, way to keep track of data. I know there was a fire in the like Chalice field office a couple years ago, and they lost a ton of monitoring data um, from paper. Yeah, that was it was on paper, and they, they lost a ton of data just from a fire. So. Things like that, um, it's really good to back up your data electronically. Um, and then, yeah, keeping data tidy, like that's kind of part of the analysis as well, right? So just 
um, making sure that you're not actually deleting or you know changing that data when you're trying to analyze it or print out a graph, etc. Yeah, and also just knowing so yeah knowing who is responsible for what and when is really important. So that's kind of similar to that um, data flow path. Knowing who should be involved at each step is really important. So, um, yeah, I know quality control is not like the most exciting topic, but it's super important, right, for making good decisions. So, good data is going to make really good decisions. And so, one of the kind of take home messages, I guess, is just doing quality control c consistently. So, through that whole process of setting up your sample design through training, calibration, uh, monitoring, and then after that, doing that consistently and constantly. Um, and you know, that's the kind of idea of active data management. So you're really involved with the data and knowing uh, its limitations as well. Um, yeah, and like I mentioned, knowing who's responsible for different steps of QC. Um, going back to that first example of like using remote sensing data, it's really good to have that metadata of knowing like, okay, who processed this data, or how is this processed? Um, what is like the error limit well, and the limitations with that data? So it's the same thing with monitoring data. We want to know who's messed with it and how they've been using that data and how they, you know, managed it. Um, and that way we can kind of know its limitations and use it effectively. Yeah. Okay. So um, I learned pretty much most of what I know from these things. They're really useful. Um, so um, the landscape toolbox has a bunch of training videos, um, additional like resources and references that are super helpful. Um, and this manual is the kind of bible in terms of the AIM monitoring for BLM. Um, and yeah, also if you want to know more about data and data excites you, uh, this um, article by Hadley Whitman is really cool. Um, he's the kind of guy who basically invented tidy data and uh, was involved with like the R, um, setting that up. So he's a really smart guy um, and that's a really useful kind of accessible paper to look at. Yeah. Any 